a very warm welcome to this Lockdown Lit Fest event where, boy, do we have an author for you. But before I introduce him, just to say from all of us, the Lockdown Lit Fest lot, as I call us, we hope you're keeping safe, we hope you're keeping well, and uh, we hope you're being careful. I'm delighted to introduce the Lockdown Lit Fest stage, John Niven, who was born in Irvine, Ayrshire, and who is the author of 10 novels, and who has written for a wide range of publications, including a weekly column for the Sunday, Scottish Sunday Mail. At least, that's the introduction that his publishers would like you to know. I happen to know that there's a lot more to John Niven than those two short lines will, uh, will inform you. So, without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to John Niven. John, it's such a pleasure to see you. If you turn to your other camera, you can see me up here. Here I am. Uh, now, first of all, how are you and where are you? I am in my uh, study in Buckinghamshire, just the west of London, which is, yeah. And you locked down solo, corralled in a room with all your books? Uh, there are lots of books, but also family here too, so not, not solo. Okay. Um, I'm delighted to hear. Now, obviously, one of the books we're going to talk about is the one that is, is it published yet or is it about to be published, which is the, I don't know how to say this, because it's a word that's got an asterisk in it, and the other letters are F and CK. So can I just say the fuck it list? I'm sure in this forum you can, yes, but I finally reached peak me, Paul, and that I've written a book whose name cannot even be spoken. (laughs) <laughs> it took a while to get there but we, we did it <laughs> well we'll talk about that in a minute and I have to say it is it is the finest of your works and I'm a huge fan of all of them uh, you first started in fact just let me say you first started with the amateurs is that the, was that the first piece of fiction no uh, music from Big Pink was the first one oh, uh, of course. then kill your friends the amateurs was the third so tell us what Big Pink was about it was about a small-time drug dealer in Woodstock in 1968 on the fringes of Bob Dylan and the band's circle. Um, sort of faction, if you will. The smashing of real people and fictional characters in it. And what did you set out to prove? What did you set out to write? Was it the, did you end up publishing the book you started to write or did it go through I set out to changes? Desperately try and get published, <laughs> as all as most first, first novels are. But that was 15 years ago now. Uh, Paul, yeah. Yeah, we uh, were you followed that up with The Second Coming. Tell us what that was about. Second Coming, that was about um, the, the Second Coming of Christ, um, who winds up on a reality TV show. That uh, sort of X Factor show. It was written at the height of sort of X Factor them um, about 2010. Uh, so, yeah, Jesus comes back and winds up on, on TV. And then, uh, after a couple, there was Straight White Male, which is the first one, I have to confess, that I read of yours, which was just a joy. What was the inspiration for that, and what were the challenges in writing it? That Straight White Male was um, where they, I, I spent four months living in Los Angeles working on a movie. I, I also worked as a, as a screenwriter yeah. in 2012. Um, and it was sort of a, about a, a, an over overpaid, overprivileged sort of Irish hell-raising writer who lives in LA and has to return to the UK for uh, complicated financial reasons. Uh, a sort of fish out of water thing, he's dry kicking and screaming back. But yeah, I think that was the first book I talked to you about, maybe at Curious, about what? six years ago, seven years ago now. Damn fine book, really fine book. I mean, can we talk a bit about screenplay writing? Because you've written so many original screenplays with writing part, or some, often with writing, your writing partner, Nick Ball. Mm-hmm. Very different dynamic, writing the collaborative aspect of writing screenplays compared to writing novels. Are they two different parts of your brain, or is the, does one complement the other? It's all storytelling. Um, the very different disciplines. I've, uh, yeah, I've written a lot of stuff with Nick. I've written a movie with Kat Moran. Um, I'm currently writing a TV thing with Neil Forsyth, who did the very wonderful Guilt, which was on BBC recently. Yeah. Um, it's, it's um, you know, I'm, as I'm sure you know, it's, a, it's quite a lonely business writing a novel. Oh, yeah. Stephen King said it's like crossing the Atlantic in a bathtub. You're kind of bailing away there on your toy for a long time. Whereas with the... Um, you know, with the screenplay, you, you, you get to work in a team and you get to meet producers and actors and things. And it's a bit more, you get to get out of the house a little bit. Would, although, of course, I mean, the, I've never written a screenplay. Well, I have, but nothing that's ever reached the public. I, so I've learned from other people, such as yourselves, that when you're a screenplay writer, and especially in Los Angeles, 
you're very much at the bottom of the food chain. Is that true? Oh yeah, 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 hugely so. Not, not in TV. It's different actually. In TV, the writers much more um, prized. That if you if you write and create a TV show, you're much more the showrunner. You have a lot more clout in TV. Right. But in movies, uh, you know, they'll change writers. Writers are interchangeable up to and including and even after, in some cases, filming, you know? Yeah. There are some very crack script doctors who get brought in to help reassemble the movie after it's been shot and write voiceover and so forth. I've got a lovely friend called uh, Bill Nicholson who wrote uh, on Gladiator and was drafted in by Ridley Scott at, uh, at last minute notice. He tells fantastic stories about that. I'll tell you off screen though, because it's a bit tricky. Um, yeah, well, that, that's the thing about movies, it's such a crap shoot. You never know what's... I mean, you look at something like Jaws, which I had no shoot, which was being written nightly while they made the movie. Yeah, there was no finished draft going into it, and you get a masterpiece, and yet you have movies that have been worked on by Oscar-winning screenwriters slavishly, and are just complete dogs. There's no, there's no logic to it sometimes. Can you write for an actor? I mean, do you get, do you get notes from a director saying, listen, we've got... Actor X, actress X here on this one. And can you get yourself in the mindset, see their previous performances and sort of put words into their mouth, knowing they can be comfortable with them? Sometimes I've written things when you're writing the script with a specific actor in mind to do the part. And nine times out of ten, you never end up getting that actor. Right. With a lot of movies, um, certainly with a budget, especially, casting goes on right up until shooting begins. It's just that sometimes you don't know for sure who's going to actually be in the movie until very close to production. Do so, you like being on set, or is that... Uh... I don't, no. Um, it's hell. I, on a movie, especially for the... I, I compare it to... It's like going to an orgy where you're not allowed to fuck anyone. You, can, <laughs> you, you just have to watch. You can, uh, it's, um, it's difficult. Um, and now and again, if you know, actors will ask you for what did you think of that, and without naming any names I did once give a note on the set of a movie and the actors thought oh that's great I'll do that and they they went back to try and incorporate that in the next take and the director said okay we got that we're moving on and uh, the actor said no no I want to go again they said no no I'm happy with it and they, that, this huge row erupted that while I sort of gradually sort of you know sneaked into the background <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's never it's never good being on set on a scale of one to ten, my will to ask you the name of the production and the actor is is watching off the score, but I know I can't. <laughs> so I'm sure my career will be over soon enough, and I'll write the tale. Of <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have no will to help that along. Believe you me. Believe you me. Um, let's come to the the most recent novel, The Fuck It List. Introduce us to Frank Brill. What who? What does he stand for? Who is he? How did he come to you? What was the setup for the book? <laughs> Well, the the um the initial idea of the novel I had maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, I've got a friend called Alan back in Scotland. He's one of these guys who's who's hilarious. Everything he says is hilarious, but he thinks he's completely sane. He's a he's a madman. And uh, we're reaching our sort of late forties at this point. I think we just got to the age where you hear of friends, you know, getting cancer and things like that and yeah. we're talking about this in the pub one night and Alan said oh you know what you'd do John if you got that diagnosis and we're all thinking well you know, swim with the dolphins go to Tibet that kind of thing he went no 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 you know you've got a list haven't you five or six of people that have really fucked you over in your life and you know you, you get a shotgun and you turn up at the door and ding dong and they open the door and you give them a second they know they know why you're there and then yeah you blow them out and <laughs> <laughs> we're all sitting there going you, you go on a killing rampage you get it. it's like ah, of course would you not do that and like all mad people he thought this was completely normal and logical but I thought that's a really funny idea for a novel um, and filed it away but I didn't do anything with it for a few years and then just over the past sort of three four years with the ascendancy of, of Trump I found myself wondering what America might look like after a decade of that say Trump Trumpism became what Thatcherism was yeah. here and it went on for 10 to 15 years what would the landscape be like around that and so those two ideas came together that I'd have this protagonist Frank Brill who's who's 60 he, he was a newspaper editor and then of course his industry was decimated by technology so he's he's this guy who gets cancer diagnosis and decides he's going to settle some scores um, 
and Trump's America in 2026. Trump's done two terms in Ivanka, is now halfway through her first term. President and Ivanka. President Ivanka, which, you know, when I began the novel two and a half years ago, it seemed like a ludicrously far-fetched satirical idea. <laughs> and that I'm increasingly thinking that this is a conceivable future we all might find ourselves living in. But Frank's got sort of, he has personal reasons, personal scores to settle, and a couple of sort of grander political scores to settle. And we gradually learn as the book goes on that he, without giving too much away, he, he lost his wife and son in a school shooting and his other daughter through a, a misperformed backstreet abortion because in the future America, abortion has been illegal for a while. And um, gun laws are now so lax in America that that you have mandatory carry in some states. You get arrested if you're not carrying a gun. (laughs) So this is the sort of landscape that Frank sits about his quest in. I mean, it is both terrifying and compulsive. I mean, it's obviously dystopian. I know it's been described as coruscating by by reviewers and, uh, and critics far better than I. How much of hit Frank Bell is actually your alter ego? How much of... How thin is the cigarette paper between how he thinks and what you'd like to do? Uh, quite thick. I'm, afraid. I'm not a sort of grudgy bearing sort of guy. Um, I'm just too lazy. <laughs> oh, do you know any people who can carry grudges for like you know years and years? I always think, where do you get the energy? I just forget. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really that kind of person. Although you know, like any sentient person. I, I, Trump's death by whatever cause would be a huge source of celebration for me. I cannot see a downside to that guy not being on the planet anymore. I've looked at it from every conceivable angle and uh, I just can't see a downside to his, you know. I'm always, whenever I say that, I, I said this in a BBC radio interview the other week and I could hear the the presenter getting the producer screaming in his ear because you can't let him say this and the guy's melting down and trying to say, but no, no, but surely we have to have, you know, you have to respect others. But no, in fact that, I'm not respecting Trump's view in anything at this point. You know, if you don't know who that guy is by this point, I can't help you, you know, and I think he ended up saying, uh, he said, but you really want him dead? And I said, yes. And I said, uh, I shouldn't say, I don't want anybody to kill him, I'm not advocating violence, but, you know, he's a big, fat old dude, surely heart attack, stroke, aneurysm, blood clot, any of those things would do me, ideally natural causes, but, yeah, get get him gone. I think you're on safe ground there. I mean, it's not like he pays any attention to any advice he gets given, even by people in his team, so, you know, he's, he's not going to he's not gonna care too much what you think, he doesn't care too much about what you think. Yeah, the guy ended up saying, Surely, I said, don't you, can you see what I'm saying? They said, well, I don't want any, I, I, I don't want anyone dead. I'm like, really? Here's Hitler. We're in 90, it's 1935, here's Hitler. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, we may disagree politically, but go about your business, mate. But, you know, you quickly end up at Godwin's Law there, don't you? You can down that argument right it's exactly. Trump's that bad. But, I mean, if you're not watching some of you, I don't know if you saw the other day, we're in the lockdown now, and there was a rally in Michigan of all these people wanting to end the lockdown. All yeah. these lunatics with machine guns and yeah, guns, quite and MAGA hats, and you know, this is Trump's people. And if you're not you're looking at those people and thinking with just the right kind of prodding, these would these people would round up people for concentration camps. They would absolutely if he demanded that, they would do it. Do you know that's a terrifying thought? That's a terrifying thought. And there are a lot of terrifying thoughts in this novel. I mean, I have to say, you know, of course, it's dystopian. It's set in the future. What does that land... But the, the, here's the trick, actually, to finish what I was going to say, I didn't manage to interrupt myself. Um, it is so pegged in, a, in, a, in the reality of now, but the potential reality of the future, that there's real terror. I mean, I had sort of raised goosebump moments in this. What does writing future dystopian allow you to do, especially when you've, when you've decided to peg it so firmly in, in, a, in a sense of reality? Um, well, it's actually quite... In some ways, it's quite tricky to write the near future, you know? Because yes. the book's only six years away from where we are now. So it's kind of... And the same way things like fascism are creeping in most cultures, like the, the way you don't notice your hair getting slightly longer from a Monday to a Friday. It's a gradual process, you know? Um, and I think, you know, if you're writing 50 or 100 years in the future, it all becomes Velcro clothes and jetpacks. That's another sort of thing, but this is it's very close to where we are now, just more so. 
uh, you know, in, in the novel is a thing called the Extreme Patriot Act. Yes. Which is kind of, you know, police now, they can just take your mobile phone off you if you film something they don't want you to film. They can detain you. The, you know, ICE sort of immigration squads are everywhere, hooked up to, you know, cameras on petrol station forecourts, uh, logging license plates to track illegal immigrants. So there's all that kind of thing happening. It's not that far removed from where we are, just hopefully enough to be scary, you know? Yeah, I'll say. Downscape. How much fun was it to write? Not as much as I thought it was going to be, because when I, as I was telling you a minute ago, when Alan sort of said the initial thing, it was hilariously funny. And then sometimes what happens when you come to write a novel is you think, well, hang on, this guy does actually have to go out and kill a bunch of people. Yeah. And as soon as you're establishing that as a dramatic reality, it becomes, well, it does a couple of things. One, it's immediately not quite as lols as I thought the book was going to be. Because in order for the audience to be with Frank and like to, because he does effectively become a serial killer yeah. and shoot people in cold blood on in the book, but you have to be with him. So that, that meant he had to have a sufficiently sad and believable and scary backstory for you to forgive him that. So that meant sort of inventing his family history, which became quite dark. So, you know, sometimes the actual story can see demands things of you that your initial conception of the book hadn't factored in. Was it difficult? Because there was, it seems that like you built in quite a lot of um, metrics within the book that you have to adhere to. I mean, a lot of rules that you had to sort of behave according to in order for the book to work. Was the structure quite tricky to get right? Let, let, a little bit. Um, I'd initially conceived it as actually a longer novel and it wound up being quite sort of 250 pages. It's one of my shorter novels because that kind of format of the road trip, um, he sort of crisscrosses the country and it, be- it became... Well, another thing that another thing that, I, that I went through maybe three or four drafts before my editor and publisher about it, and one thing I added quite late in the game was this cop who's on his trail, a sort of rogue cop, who yeah. he's killed one of his friends. Um, and that became a sort of more traditional thriller device because I realised that the, the narrative kind of needed that element of is he going to get caught to sustain it? And then, then, it, then it accidentally did give us quite a nice bit of black comedy late in the book after the cop who's a, you know, 20 stone voracious overeater has suffered a... I wouldn't say it, it's a spoiler, but um, yeah, um, it's... Uh, Blackly comic would be the way I'd describe the denouement. I know if this is going to hurt, you were described as um, John Niven is our Hunter S. Thompson. How thrilled were you to hear that accolade and then thinking, oh, that's, that's quite a burden to carry? <laughs> well, thankfully, you know, right, excuse me, I don't have the virus, I've just got a slight cough. I'll be um, uh, would, that I, would that I could live up to the lifestyle? Alone, let alone the pros. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think Hunter's average day um, would kill me now. <laughs> are you about, did you admire his writing? I mean, who, who are your influences when you, I mean, you're obviously a very famous reader. He's one of those writers, and there's a few of these who I admired more as a journalist than a novelist. Right, yes, okay. Um, I think, you know, uh, and it gets an age thing. I think um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is one of those books that you, you love around the age of kind of 19, 20, 21. Yeah. And then you, you know, there's a few writers like that, isn't there? Kerouac, Bukowski. They're kind of, when you're a young man, you think, well, these guys are fantastic. I'm not sure how well some of them hold up in the long haul. Bukowski actually, I picked up Ham and Rye recently for the first time in years and really, really enjoyed it. So yeah, but I hadn't read that in a long time. Um, has it stood yeah. the test of time? I had actually. I really enjoyed it. it more, more than I was expecting to for some reason. While we're talking about reading, mm. would you do us a big one? Would you do us a huge favour and read an extract from the fuck it list? Sure, of course, of course, of course. I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll read you an extract from quite uh, early on in the book, which um, Frank's come home having had his cancer diagnosis. Um, his only relationship, he lives alone at this point in his life, and his only relationship he has is, is with Alexa, his home, you know, speaker, computer. But he um, he comes home and he um, catches some TV. Alexa, Frank called over his shoulder. CNN. 
He heard the TV come to life behind him. He turned round to see the parade in Washington was in full flow. Huge crowds were packed into the bleachers, waving their flags, cheering in their red MAGA and CAGA and MAG hats as they watched the soldiers and the hardware rumble past. Tanks, howitzers, assault vehicles, rocket launchers, thousands of troops, all lumbering away from the White House towards the capital. The lead tanks were huge M1 Abrams battle tanks, each weighing 60 short tons. Soldiers stood up through the open hatches, rigidly saluting the podium. You could faintly hear the cheers in the background, USA, 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 as the camera swung over the rows of spectators. And here it was, the real America, the people who had travelled from Florida, from, in from Indiana, from Kentucky, up to Washington, spending money they could ill afford to pay their respects on Veterans Day. They were cold and wet and mostly old and fat and they were all wrapped in thin cheap coats with their cardboard signs saying God bless the Trumps, death to Democrats and of course lock her up. The last one was increasingly puzzling to Frank as former Senator Clinton had died peacefully in her sleep three years ago. Perhaps they feared a ghost situation, a zombie Hillary clawing her way out of the grave, desperately trying to take their guns and delete more emails. There had been no tank for the first few years. The roads in Washington couldn't handle it. One of Trump's first acts early in his second term had been to order a multi-billion dollar program to widen and strengthen Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Avenue to accommodate the monsters every November. As Frank remembered this, as if on cue, the cameras cut to the presidential podium. President Trump and her husband, Greg, her second husband, her first, Jared, was still languishing on Rikers Island, having taken the fall for an awful lot of shit. <laughs> Vice President Hannity and his wife were on her left, and on her right, still towering over the others, even at 80, Donald, and his new wife, his fourth wife, Crystal, her belly swollen in the final trimester of her pregnancy. Thunder erupted suddenly as three fighter planes smashed through the sky above the parade. Trump put a protective hand on Ivanka's shoulder as he shouted into her ear over the jet roar, his finger jabbing into the sky. Ivanka wore a cream overcoat and fur hat. Her father had his trademark black overcoat and red tie. Trump looked down at the vast cheering crowd and gave them his signature thumbs up. They went wild. It had been a masterstroke, you had to admit. Firing pens halfway through his second term and nominating Ivanka as VP before resigning the office due to ill health. Ivanka automatically became president and had 18 months in the saddle before she had to fight an election. Obviously, one of her first acts in office had been to pardon her own father of the multitude of charges he faced. Oh, bravo. John Niven reading there from his latest work, The Fuck It List, which is published by, who's published you, John? Uh, it says William Heidemann, Brandon House. Heidemann. What a fantastic piece. I mean, that's a joyous piece of writing and utterly terrifying. Well, a little, on the next page, actually, we've gone a little longer. You find out that the <laughs> one of the reasons Trump's married again is that... Um, Melania dies in a mysterious helicopter accident um, just after the ink had dried in their divorce and news had leaked to the press that she's planning a tell-all autobiography. He mysteriously disappears. How are you with conspiracy theories, John Niven? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I, I'm not that kind of guy, but um, in, with this mob, with the Trumps, I mean, I think anything's, anything's possible, you know? Anything's possible. Listen, I said we talk about music a bit, and I want to talk to you because you started off, um, well, you did, I'm not sure if you actually started off. No, you started off really getting first-class honours in English literature from Glasgow. Uh, but I know you work for a load of record companies, including London Records and Independiente. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the music business like when you joined, and what made you join it, other than the fun? Uh, at the time, I thought it was just the fun, but I can, looking back now... Um, I think there was a degree of uh, avoidance in me doing that career and that I'd already made at least two, maybe three attempts to write a novel. Oh, really? In, That's in, really in, in my early 20s, yeah, before the, you know, sort of during and just after university when I was sort of 22, 
23 maybe. Um, and I hadn't got there, I hadn't been able to, I hadn't finished the novel. Um, because I, in fact, I, I must, I still have the manuscripts somewhere and I've just been too scared to look at them over the years because the skin will crawl undoubtedly. But I, I think I had a lot of the same sort of way of expressing myself and a similar sort of take on things, but I just didn't have anything with the self-discipline that you need to be a writer until I was in my thirties. It was going to be another 10 years before I, I got there that I could shut the door every day for the, the sort of five or six, four or five hours yeah. for a year at a stretch that you need to do to write a novel. I didn't have that skill yet. I was still sort of looking for a good time, if you, too much, you know. And also, it seemed to me even then that you were probably doomed to fail, you know. Um, so I sort of fell into the music industry as a way I thought, well, I could do this and I'll get well paid. And, you know, it was the 90s and we were fabulously well paid and got to travel the world and I had, I had a great time, you know, uh, ten, in hindsight, 10 years of it was probably slightly too much experience. Five might have done it. Um, if I have a regret, I'd maybe if I could turn, turn the clock back, I might get out a little quicker and write the book. But, uh, you know, it, these things take as long as they take, don't they? There's a nice resonance in that. With, uh, I think it's being at the beginning of chapter two in the bucket list where Frank is talking to his father, who is a typesetter. I think you say throwing hot metal. Mm. Um, tell, Frank tells his father he wants to be his writer and his father says something like what is it seems like it might be tough to make money out of that or something yeah like that. Tough, way, tough way to make a living and so tough yeah make a living. yeah exactly yeah. so in the music industry you were in A&R mm. who, who did you spot who did you sign was there anybody that has endured no, nobody of huge well Mogwai who I signed are uh, still yeah. very successful um, and a great band who have been going for a long time now um an American act called the Pernice Brothers who have made a lot of great records um, and still do. But uh, no, a lot of, we had some, uh, London records where I worked at first was very much a smash and grab, sort of take the money and run pop hits label. So we had a lot of fun there. But uh, one of the first records I signed was the Mike Flowers Pops version of Wonderwall by Oasis, yeah. which was so nearly the Christmas number one uh, and end of 1990. Five. Um, we just got pipped by Michael Jackson's Earth Song, which I still can't hear the opening bars of that song to this day without exploding in murderous rage. And that might, I, might, I might have filed away a little Michael Jackson score back then, sort of 25 years ago, that I was going to settle one day. <laughs> you had a, actually, do I remember you had a huge rant? Um, it was in the Independent. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't call it a, I wouldn't call it a rant, Paul. I call it a sort of justified. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I am merely rehashing something I read. Of course, I'm entirely on your side. And you were completely right. But what was the point of view? It was the kind of week he died, and all the tri- uh, you know, if you read all the papers and you watched the coverage, nobody was going there. Nobody said anything about the darker side of Jackson's yeah. life. And I, I get separating the art and the artist, and uh, you know, I'm not saying that the music hasn't touched my genius and timeless, but there were some fairly troubling aspects that just weren't being discussed anywhere. So I wrote a fairly long piece for the Independent that um, sort of laid bare the sort of case for the prosecution. You know? Yeah. And uh, what I learned from that is whoa, don't, taking on the Jackson fans is like taking on uh, gun nuts or Christians. These people are true believers and nothing you say can dent their belief system. They will just keep coming at you and keep coming at you. So that's been, this, is, this would have been in 2000 and eight, well, when did Jackson die? 2008, nine? Eight, nine, yep. Around then. Um, and so, I, but I always thought that the the idea of the life of Michael Jackson was sort of an open goal for the novelist. Yeah. Um, and I sort of filed that away and then a, a decade later, Kill Your Friends was published in 2008 and was my first sort of best-selling novel. And a decade later, in 2018, I wrote a sequel called Kill Em All in which the the main antagonist, Lucius Dupre, is a pop star who's very, you know, who owes a debt, shall we say, to Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> How bad did the, um, did the response from the Jackson... Illuminati get? Well, I say bad, God. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a fat one. It wasn't Salman Rushdie. Um, it was, um, it's just endless on Twitter, you know. I very rarely block anyone on Twitter, but I remember these 
people would just keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming you know they it's, you know they, 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 they as I say it's like Christianity or gun yeah. rights they, they, you make your decision and it's you go all the way now that we know that we know and we know that it's out there do you feel vindicated because you really put your I mean you do put your head above the parapet it's a very brave thing to do at the time tiny bit well I have to say when the the finding the um, is it finding Neverland or leaving Neverland the documentary about this, some of his uh, abuse survivors came out in uh, 2019, just as the novel Kill 'Em All was been published in Europe and Germany, mm-hmm. and uh, um, we had a big sales bump off that. So a lot of the press they picked up and said, oh, "Hang on, this guy, this guy called this." You know, I, mean, I, I, I don't even think it's like calling it. I mean, it, well, it's not a huge insight in my part. I think to know that that was going to happen. No, the other thing that I sort of <laughs> that I don't feel I deserve any credit for calling is I won quite a lot of money on Donald Trump in the last few years. I won a pile of money on his election because I was just convinced I was in LA at the time, and just at the last minute I became convinced he was going to win. And I thought if that does happen, it was still very unlikely. Um, I, I won some money off it, so a bunch of bets. How do you mean? One right. I, I placed a bunch of bets because the the bookies then were starting to put caps on it. You couldn't get much more than a couple hundred quid on. Okay. Um, but you were still getting around 10 to 1. So uh, we won quite a bit. But actually, they put the, I, was, I was in LA, so I was phoning Charlotte back in England, getting her to go to the bookies. Yeah. And the last one she went in to put on, she put the, went to put the bet down, and the girl said, oh, do you, oh, you like Trump then, do you? And she went, no, I don't, I don't like him, but... I've got a feeling we might win this bet. And she said, oh, I like him. And she said, what do you like about him? She said, well, you know, he speaks his mind. He tells it how it is. So at that point, I'm going to get more money on. If this lunatic, <laughs> gum chewing toe rag in Ladbrokes outside London reckon this, what are they thinking in middle America? This is a banker. So sure enough, we won a bunch of money. And then I immediately took about a third of the winnings and we rolled it over onto an impeachment bet. Oh, which really? we then we then won in January there. Wow. Um, and again, I think we got about five or six to one in the impeachment bet. And by by the end of last year, it was like beyond even. You couldn't they weren't taking the bet, you know. And a couple of friends said, but "How did you? How did you get that? How did you know that was coming?" And I said, "Well, look, the, winning the election was a bit of a leap. That was a bit of a sort of you know there were odds there." But I said, "The impeachment bet." It's, that's a lock I don't know why MD with half of a brain didn't take that bet uh, criminals are going to crime you cannot put a giant criminal in that sort of position of cookie jars all around him and he's not going to crime it's, that, was a, you know, that was a lock you know what did you so, spend the money on? We, we, <laughs> funnily enough we, we spent a chunk on a, on a trip to LA <laughs> just before <laughs> the lockdown we, um, we took the family out and rented a very nice house in, uh, in West Hollywood <laughs> <laughs> so the way Trump got it back at least he went staying at Mar-a-Mar, yeah. <laughs> and, and a way we put it back into the American tourist industry <laughs> <laughs> um, you are I mean you, you're a staunch Republican everybody knows that um, and I know that you don't sing God Save the Queen tell us why not <laughs> well I don't sing God Save the Queen no and I don't sing hymns because I, I'm like it's, I'm, it's a bit Rick from the young ones I know I'm a bit of a teenage atheist um, but I just, I just I can't you know what's the James Joyce quote of all this I will not bow to what you know yeah, I, 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 I can't in, in church when people do I'll get up and I'll stand up but you know my friend Ed Simons uh, says whenever we've been at a wedding together he says he loves to look over and see my proud atheistic face <laughs> as I'm <laughs> deliberately not singing some innocuous hymn well, I've always had top respect for you for that. The fact that you have principles and you stand up for them, however countercultural or however socially anti-cultural. <laughs> socially good. Good no. Listen, John, you've had such good success. I mean, you've lived life to the full, and I've I've always loved that. And you pour it into your writing. What does to be able, you know, to, be able to say best selling? To be able to say have the fans and the readers that you have. What does that mean to you? Given the work you put into the work you put out. Uh, I mean, well, to, to touch on what we said earlier, I sort of avoided becoming a novelist all through my twenties and my early thirties because I thought it was I was bound to fail. Mm. And then I finally rolled the dice. Guess when I started writing music from Big Pink, I was maybe 33, 34, um, 36 it was published maybe, and so I felt I was quite a late starter. Um, and it's just I feel sort of relief 
to have a, a readership more than anything else, you know? It's not it's not a readership that's going to give, you know, in terms of volume, J.K. Rowling, any sleepless nights. But um, it kind of, it, it, it's, it's, it's hugely um, satisfying to know that there's an audience there for what you write. You know, because now with social media, you experience an audience's reaction when you publish a book much more than you used to. You know, it used to be you get the odd letter or you meet, fans at a lit fest you know but now it's just, as a novel comes out and you see the feedback on Twitter it's very gratifying but m- most of the you know there's not a day goes by I don't sort of um, kiss the floor of my study with relief that we, I get to do this final question for me what can you give away what are you uh, what are you working on what's going through your mind at the minute what's exercising what do you think oh hello this is a story well, funnily enough I am just finishing I'm about 2,000 words away from finishing the next novel which um, is a sort of comedy horror. And uh, again, it touches on Trump. It's set on election night in 2016 in a remote gas station supermarket in America. And it's kind of a bit, if you imagine the two movies, Kevin Smith's Clarks and uh, John Carpenter's The Thing, yeah. mesh together it's about these saps and minimum wage and a couple of customers in this remote location and this creature becomes involved and it's all set in real time over the election night of 2016 and there's a fair spectrum of political views amongst these people and uh, then this the, the ultimate illegal alien if you will arrives to sort of um, show them the futility of their views so and in my in my mind grandly I'm hoping that this book I'm hoping my prediction the fuck it list doesn't come true and that we're all short of Trump come November. Um but also hopefully this book will form part of a rough trilogy. You know, as Kill 'em all was set in two thousand and seventeen in America with the first year of Trump's presence as the backdrop. And then I've written the, the current novel, the fuck it list is a future. Trump landscape and this one's set in a late so uh, in my mind maybe if, if the books are all still in print in the future we might get, uh, get them collected a sort of rough trilogy taking us through these um, interesting times what a fantastic idea I've often often friends of mine have said oh what's you know, see me reading you know, you know, in the house or whatever and they say what's John Niven's books like I say well imagine John Niven is putting the conversation that you imagine is going to happen in any Edward Hopper painting <laughs> 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 and the one you just described with the addition of a sort of carpenter twist I mean that just stands out to you I'm just seeing a, a gas station with two down lights in the middle of nowhere like a hopper painting and there you are you turn it into something completely different that's, pretty, that's very flattering Paul so hopefully if we're spared we'll get the chance to talk about it in a, in a yes, couple of minutes anything you want to say to your readers before we go uh, thank you thank you for thank you for tuning in thank you for reading I hope you're all keeping safe and abiding by um, lockdown rules and that will all be out of this soon thank you John very much indeed thank you ladies and gentlemen uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen for uh, coming to see this lockdown lit fest event where you've been listening to John Liver and I talking about his latest book The Fuck It List and the one that's coming out have you got a title for it yet? not yet but I do but it's a working title and the, the Fuck It List was a working title and then look where that got us I've <laughs> <laughs> play come, so I'm keeping it to myself now for the moment <laughs> stand, I don't blame you stand on your shelves ladies and gentlemen as ever we hope that you are keeping well that you're being safe and that you're being careful thank you for joining us cheerio thank you